In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. I would like to start off this session, you know, with a reading from the Sacred Scripture. And it uh, basically, it's from chapter 18 uh, of the Gospel of Luke. And it's uh, verses 7 uh, and 8. And it goes like this. Will not God then accuse, or will not God then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night? Will he be slow to answer them? I tell you, he will see to it that justice is done for them speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And so that, that's very interesting because we ask ourselves the question, you know, uh, how will there be faith on earth? Well, obviously the faith has to be handed on from generation to generation. And so that heritage of faith is something that cannot be ignored. It's something that will lead to there being faith on the earth. And so the, the, the logic of this and, and the consistency of this is, is, is very, very, you know, very, very clear. And so Jesus you know, says this because he's asking us to think about that. Because there's a lot of power in what he said. Even in that last sentence, it's the sense that what constitutes carrying on the faith from generation to generation? And we're talking about religious education. We're talking about the family. We're talking about how we're introduced to the faith, how to practice the faith. And so the thing is, we find in this day and age that, you know, we have been given the gift of our faith, and so we, we practice our faith. And it becomes difficult you know, when, say, in this day and age, when we have all the stresses, you know, and all the demands of the secular life, that in the midst of all that, how is the faith passed on? And so there are, there are a number of different ways that that's done, okay? We go to church, okay? We go to, you know, the, the parish religious ed education program. The DRE is in, in, in charge of making sure you know, that the students get the right materials and that they will get to know, you know, the faith uh, and material, materials that are designed, you know, for each age group. And so this is a magnificent thing. This is part of the generational handing on. But it, the, 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 the family is going to be the first time where faith is introduced from the very beginning. When we learn how to say our Hail Mary, when we learn how to say our Father, um, our act of contrition, how to go to confession, okay? going to Mass. What is, what is the Mass telling us? You know, how do we come to believe the divine presence, the real presence in the sense of receiving the body of Jesus Christ in Holy Communion? And so we find that all these things are part of religious education and ancestral transference, transferring from one generation to the next. Now we find that Young people today are under a lot of stress. They're under a lot of pressure, okay, in the sense that the world is demanding you know, them to get the highest education they, pro they can possibly get. And so you know, there's the family influence, there's, there's the religious influence, but there's the secular influence. And the thing is, does the secular influence interfere in any way with the family or with religious education? And we have to say, yes, there are some negative aspects because they're being taught by others. They're being taught by professors and those in the capacity to you know, bring ideas to them and, and thoughts that they never had before in some kind of an analysis of the reality that they're facing after education. Okay? And, and some of those influences can be, for the, ho for the most part, positive, but there can be a negative aspect too, in the sense that you know, why do young people um, why, why do some of them, why do they not go to church anymore? They don't practice the faith. You know, their, their time is occupied with so many demands. You know, time to study. You know, time to do this. Influences from friends. Peer pressures. Peer influences. And so they can lose track of, of, of their obligation to go to Mass, to go to church. And of course, the, the, there, there can be a tremendous assault on the real presence 
In a sense, this is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they, they have to believe that because that's the truth. But many doubts can be put into their minds by secular society. Again, secular society, secular education, there's the positive and the negative, like, like anything else. Okay. And so the thing is, oftentimes the parents, you know, will inadvertently blame themselves that they didn't do something right in educating their kids. You know, they taught them everything they possibly could in terms of prayer and the religion and sending them to, you know, Catholic school or sending them to PRE, you know. And so they, they begin to think, well, is there something I didn't do? Is there something that I did do that wasn't right? You know, and, and the thing is, is they start to feel a sense of guilt. But, but that guilt needs to be, you know, um, they need to be delivered from that because what they're finding, you know, is that they need to realize that secular influence can do a lot of undoing. It can present challenges that young people uh, are maybe not prepared to face or that it becomes so influential that they begin to put their spiritual life on the so-called back burner. It becomes something that's not as important to them as some other things. And that's a problem in our secular society, in our technological society, in the technology that can be good or evil. There's good aspects of technology, there's negative aspects to technology. And so we have to take this all into account in order to create some kind of a balance. Because our salvation comes first. That's the most important thing. The other things are really secondary. Because those things are something in our education that enables us, of course, to, to get along in the secular life, you know, in employment or whatever our calling may be, you know, whatever our, our talents are leading us and how we analyze or come to understand what our talents are. And so the pressure of that can, again, cause people, young people primarily in this day and age, to either leave the faith completely or not have it being as important as it should be in the obligation to attend church, to receive Holy Communion, to go to confession, to pray, you know, to pray with others. The communion of saints, the getting together, holy sacrifice of the Mass. And the, 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 the mystical aspect of, of what that is in terms of the, of the salvation of our souls, the purification of our souls. How our souls are given life through the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, but also through what we know in terms of knowledge about the faith. Knowledge and feelings. You know, dealing with feelings in reference to the spread of the gospel, the spread of the good news. And that has to be something that is generational. It has to be hand, handed on. And so when we continue to take a look at the, uh, the family tree, uh, we see that the whole sense of, of transferring or <clears throat> you know, bringing the faith to the next generation is something that needs to be done very carefully, you know, and it needs to be uh, done in a way where there is a time of enlightenment and those who are going to be educated, um, you know, in that faith. And so there has to be, you know, a familiarity with scripture, there has to be a familiarity with the teachings of the church, uh, there has to be an understanding of, of, of sacrament and so on, you know. Now, the last time we, we, we uh, stopped at generational sin. And so just to redefine that again, um, one cannot make an act of repentance for an individual's sin vicariously. In other words, an example would be, you know, a so-and-so relative, you know, committed a mortal sin. And we know, we know it's a mortal sin, you know. And so we can't say to the Lord, Lord, I don't want them to have that sin uh, on their soul, put it on mine. Okay? You, you, you can't do that. That's, that's vicarious. You know, that, that really robs you of your free will in the sense that, well, you know better, so you're not going to commit that sin, but you can't take that responsibility on oneself. Okay? Um, 
Now, there, there's a word, it's called imputability. Imputability. And what that means, sin cannot be transferred from one person to another. For example, from your ancestor to yourself. It's the same thing. Now, when we talk about, you know, generational passing on of the faith, we find that there's a lot involved in that in the sense that you have behavioral patterns that we're dealing with in families. Uh, we're having, you know, uh, attention, a sense of hearing, a sense of knowing. And, uh, and, and so in that, in that sense, it's, it's not only a psychological development in terms of human development uh, as we grow, you know, from an infant and so on, uh, all the way up into adulthood. Uh, and so that's important. But when it comes to sin, it's a different kind of thing in the sense that the patterns and the spiritual patterns, you know, are transferred from one generation to the next, just as, uh, as much as the psychological behaviors and manifestations of personality are handed on. And so there, there's, there's a slight difference here. Um, and so we find that we, what we can do in terms of our understanding of, of, of our relatives or our ancestors uh, is that we can express regret that they did that. Okay. We can express remorse, remorse for relatives who have offended God or opposed God's will. And so that's a loved one is caring towards another in the sense that they're, they're feeling remorse or regret because they did something that was ethically or morally wrong. Okay. Perfect example of that would be in this day and age is that parents try very carefully to transfer or teach their children the faith. Okay? Uh, very carefully. They do, they do everything possible to be able to have them have that advantage of faith and especially going to church, going to mass. You know, and it's the same with any Christian denomination, going to church, being part of the community. And so because of the secular world and certain aspects of secular education, we find that young people leave the church or they don't practice their faith anymore because they're preoccupied with the demands of the secular world. And so those parents who try very carefully you know, to uh, pass that faith on to them, they feel remorse for that. They feel, you know, a, a sadness um, and, 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 and a, a sense of they can't really try to deal with it immediately. But the thing is, did it, is it something I did or didn't do? Um, did I teach them right? And so there can be an element of guilt with that or, or an examination of why that took place. And so it's, it's important that they not take the blame for that on themselves, but it's the secular society was so influential uh, that that really is, can be the factor that, that leads young people away. Because you know, what are they being educated in? You know, um, what kind of a college are they going to? Um, what are their teachers doing, you know? Because some teachers can be extremely convincing in the expertise of their communication skills that may in fact lead a young person astray from the faith. And maybe they don't even intend to do that, but it's the sense that their influences are being bombarded. It can be overwhelming, you know? Uh, the pressure, the stress of academic achievement, you know? and being able to regurgitate what they learned to prove that they learned it, you know, is, is a very stressful, a very demanding way of life for a student uh, in higher education. Um, and so anyway, so that's, these are the things that, um, that, that parents sometimes in this day and age, you know, struggle with. But there needs to be a recognition that, you know, there are others that are teaching them, you know, either for or against a relationship with God. And so we take that into, uh, into account. And so we, we don't want to see people in our family offend God or oppose his will. Okay? His will is for us to have faith. I mean, that's obviously very clear to have faith. 
And again, so Jesus asked that question, will there be faith? Will he find faith on the earth? And so it's a kind of a, a sense of asking a question that doesn't necessarily need to be answered. It's a speculation in reflection of what the gospel is all about in the larger context, which is to spread the gospel, the good news, evangelization. And as John Paul II has said, the new evangelization. Because we need to go back out there and understand the secular society in a sense where uh, there may be a way to counteract the negativity of what young people may be receiving in terms of religious faith. Okay. So now, now there's, there's another bond that can be very negative, okay? and it's characterized as a controlling bond. A controlling bond. And so what this is, is a negative bond between two people. It can be destructive, a negative bond. You know, uh, it's what we call like enabling, okay? Uh, an example would be an addiction problem. You know, a family member has an addiction problem, okay? And so that person has certain demands in terms of being addicted to a substance or, or, or whatever. You know, it, it can be like, say, for example, alcoholism, okay? Well, we find that the controlling bond could be that person who is addicted has a strong influence in a manipulative way on their spouse or on their other, other family member to the point where, you know, the other family member, of course, wants their spouse or a relative to be happy, you know, uh, to be in control of themselves, uh, to have some sense of well-being, and so, in many ways, they inadvertently or overtly support, not really intending to do so, but the sense that that bond is something where they enable the person to continue in that addictive way of life because they don't want to confront them. Because that confrontation may destroy the marriage, may destroy the family relationship. And so we find that there's always the risk that when the person is confronted, you know, it could be an intervention, for example. You know, family members getting together to convince a person they got a problem, you know? And so the thing is, what can, what the, most, the worst thing that could happen is the person is so closed off to any kind of intervention or any kind of, you know, a willingness on others to help that they become isolated. They, they, they go off because the only thing in their life is the substance. It's the substance that dominates their whole life. It's almost like an idol. And it can probably be put into the category of being an idol. Because that's the only thing that gives them any meaning and purpose in life. And when we think about the evil people who control them in terms of the dealers that make money on manipulating and taking advantage of people, which is, of course, the work of the devil. You know, and in this day and age, when you start talking about the work of the devil, it's like, well, you know, what are you bringing that up for? There's no devil. You know, it's just all psychological. It's all behavioral. It all has to do with something where they can be going to therapy or they can be going to a, a detox or a rehabilitation. That's what it is. It doesn't have nothing to do with the, with the devil or God or whatever. And there's a strong tendency of that in our society today. But in recognizing the, 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 the necessity for us to take evil seriously, we have to think in terms that evil has a source in terms of a spiritual dimension. Okay? And so this is very, very important, and it can be destructive, this, this controlling bond. Now, a relationship may start well. Okay? Every married couple and every child coming into a family. Okay? All of this is, of course, uh, relationships that start off initial, initially well. Okay? One person becomes passive okay? and totally dependent upon the other. And so there's a loss of identity for that person. Unable to break away from control. It's a possession syndrome. It, the one person is so dominating or so controlling that the other person becomes dependent upon them and there, there's a psychological name for that. It's, it's a dependency. It's, it's a, um, you know, they're, they're dependent. Uh, 
And so this, this is very, very negative in the sense that the person begins to lose their identity because they are so totally dependent on the other person for their affirmation, you know, for their every single need. And of course, that's a very negative thing. And so when the person who is being manipulated or controlled comes to that realization, obviously there's going to be a confrontation. But that's the other person rebelling against the oppression of being controlled by another human being. <clears throat> and so we, we see this again. There's always the psychological dimension. But whenever we talk about the psychological dimension, we have to be aware that there's a spiritual dimension too, which is the meaning and purpose of life. You know, where do we want to go when we pass on, when we die? We want to go to heaven. It's a simple thing, you know. So encompassed in that faith, hope, and love is this sense that the person has to have a sense of their own destiny. And when someone is controlling them and they're dependent on someone else, when they suddenly awaken to that which, which is going on, there's going to be a confrontation. But that's the person coming to the light. Okay, and, and it could be like in the early church, it was, you know, say one of the, one of the family members becomes a Christian. And, and the others, they're wondering what's going on with that person. So they will make an effort to try to control that person to keep them from becoming a Christian for a number of different reasons, which would be in that time and place in the early church, the secular world, the outside world, the ways of the world, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so that person has to make a decision. Are they going to choose Jesus Christ? And in the early church, sometimes that meant that when they choose Jesus Christ, that's going to distance them from their family. But the thing is, they will be united with other Christians who believe in Jesus Christ, and that is their family. Primarily the spiritual family. And Jesus says he's going to bring a sword into the world. Don't, don't get me wrong. He's saying face reality that the belief in me is going to cause disturbances in families and persecution. And, and taking the life of other family members because of, of all the different distortions in terms of what people may have heard about Christianity which is all wrong but then when that one person comes to Jesus Christ and their life is transformed that's going to divide the family. But what, they, what the family members don't realize is that that is a person coming to a community that's ancestral. Because that person is going to pass on belief in Jesus Christ and their Christian faith on to others. And that's how the church grew. The mystical body of Christ. The church. Okay, so we find that, um, you know, this codependency or this, this, this sense of, um, you know, being dependent upon each other to the exclusiveness of keeping other people out or not being attentive, you know, to a, a social context, but really just in a sense kind of feeding into each other's, you know, interdependence in a way that becomes, you know, negative. And so we have to take into account those aspects. And so when we talk about healing the family tree, we're talking about, again, the psychological dimension, but we're talking about the spiritual dimension. And so they're intertwined in our humanity. And so the thing is, is we take on the divinity of Jesus Christ in that spiritual sense and realm because Jesus is inviting us to be part of him, to be one with him. And that's what we call the unitive way. That's what we discussed in terms of the, sp the stages of the spiritual life. And so it's a very important for us to realize that. And so healing the family tree, we look at it from the perspective that the healing of that tree is the living and the dead. Because we communicate with the dead, not in a seance, which is terribly evil, you know, and demonic, and the occult. It's more of a sense that we are united with those who have gone before us because we believe that they still know us. They're not isolated from us spiritually, just physically. Okay? And, so, and so this sense of, of, of the need for us to pray for our relatives is, is very, very important. And so those in this world and those in the next. So we, we, and the thing is, you know, when, when our relative dies, where do they go? 
That's a big question in Christianity. Where do they go? Now, if someone is an atheist and someone they love dies, it's like, that's the end. There is no afterlife. You know? um, there's, there's nothing after that. We, a person becomes nothing. That's a hard thing to believe that there's no hope after death. It's very, very troubling. And so we find that with this sense of, of knowing that like next week we're going to have the, the uh, celebration of remembrance. Well, why are we doing that? We're doing that because we believe that our relatives are still alive, not in this world, but in the next. And so that's the hope. That's where the hope resides, is the sense that we're looking forward to our own resurrection, as they were looking forward to their resurrection. And so this all is, you know, based on what we believe is the immortality of the soul, that the soul does not die. The soul is incapable of dying. It lives forever. And it's transformed in the sense that there's going to be a time when that soul is united with a glorified body like Jesus' body. And we're one with him. We, we, we're in heaven. You know? And there's so much speculation about, well, what do you do in heaven? You know? Can, can you have as many hamburgers as you want? Can you have many um, you know, croissants and, and um, eclairs? As you, you know? and, and Jesus is saying, it's not, it's not about that. You know? but, and so the thing is, it can get kind of you know, um, uh, humorous in the sense of people speculating about what's going to, what we're going to do in heaven. You know, are we going to be bored? <laughs> you know? There's something greater than what we experience here in this life sensually. Okay. And so this, this idea of the immortality of the soul and prayer is prayer is a bond. We pray with, to Jesus, we're in, we're in a bond with him. We're bonding with him. The saints, we bond with them. Our relatives, our family members, wherever they are. You know, whether it be in this process of purification and purgatory, whether they're in heaven, or whatever it is that's part of God's mercy for those who, of course, go on to the next life, is there that sense that there's still a bond, there's a connection. You know, that's why we, we pray for the dead, you know. At every Mass, you know, we, we pray for all those who have gone before us marked with a sign of faith. Our deceased family members and friends, okay? And so, again, this, this, this expression and intercession, okay, prayer, the expression, intercession, meaning the bond there is effective, that there's something that transforms us, about us putting our prayers to the Lord in the expression of prayer, whatever that may be. Okay? When we say our morning prayers, when we say our evening prayers, you know, it's establishing that expression. And usually in those prayers, there's intercession. It's like, Lord God, protect me this day. The, the prayer to St. Michael, the prayer to our guarding angel. You know? and, and, and it's a prayer of, you know, for our relatives, our family members. You know, um, a lot of different things that manifest itself in intercession, praying for others. Well, if we can pray for our brother or sister in, in, in L.A., in California, and we're here, it's it, it, the same thing when we pray for somebody, you know, who, who is deceased, have gone before us, you know, we pray for them even though we're here and they're there. You know? So it's, it's, it's very human, and it's caught up in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, Life now and forever. The meaning of life. The meaning of life. What is the meaning of life? Well, there's many different answers for that. You know, uh, philosophically, theog theologically, you know, uh, it, it can be very intellectual, um, but there's always a kind of an under undercurrent of feeling. You know, sometimes when we pray, we, we feel the presence of the Lord Jesus. We feel the presence. You know, sometimes feel the presence of a loved one who's going on. But then sometimes we don't have that feeling. But we still pray because we need to persevere in prayer. Even when we are going through a, a difficult time or under trial and tribulation. And so again, you know, it's, it's this matter, the meaning of life. Well, the meaning of life can be expressed in the sense that keeping the soul alive. Okay. When I was in Catholic school, you know, we taught, again, you know, some of you may know this, um, but 
the, the way that the catechism you know, portrayed it and the sisters portrayed it was you got this pure milk bottle and there's pure milk in there. You know, there's not a spot of imperfection. You know, it's, it's, the soul is fully alive. Well, what happens is when we start to sin, there's little specks to get in there, you know? Little specks get into the, into the milk and in the bottle that's our soul. And if there's too many specks, it begins to lose its, its, its purity. It, be, it begins to spoil, okay? And, and it was characterized in a sense that the soul is dead. The death of the soul. But the thing is, it's not the death in the sense that it doesn't exist anymore. It's death in the sense that it's not receiving the grace that's necessary for it to be looking forward to an eventual resurrection where the soul is unified with the glorified body. All right? But that's the way they characterized it, you know, in that image. It was a very clear image when I think about the way it was presented to us in, in the Baltimore Catechism. And of course now I think that at PRE or, or, or you know, D, uh, and the DREs and, uh, you know, the CCDs, you know, all these religious education programs, you know, um, they have more creative ways of, of, of portraying that um, in, in, in a catechism. Or, you know, I, I, I really don't know the teaching tools, you know, that they use now, um, but they have to be, you know, teaching the truth in a clear, specific, you know, learnable way. And, of course, it all comes back to the catechism of the Catholic Church, which took years to develop. And it's, it's about that thick, because there's a lot of stuff there. And they tend to break that catechism down to be able to, you know, um, make it understandable to different age groups. So it's very creative. And, and that was the way it was with the Baltimore Catechism, too. There was Baltimore Catechism one, there was two, there was three. And it got to the high school Baltimore Catechism, which was a little, a little thicker, that encompassed all the others, but then elaborated in a more expressive way, and so on. Okay? So this is religious education. This is something that's part of our life in terms of how we were educated, because that faith was given to us. It was, it was ancestrally taught to us, and it's, it's our you know, obligation to spread that to the next generation through school, but primarily, you know, obviously, you know, from the family. Okay, so now, keeping the soul alive and well as it affects every aspect of our being. Okay? It's all about being alive. You know, it, it says, I feel so alive. You know, well, what does that mean? You know, I feel so alive. It's a feeling. Okay? But feelings are like the weather. You, know, you feel good one day, you don't feel so hot the next day. Something happened. You're feeling alive. And then all of a sudden, I feel really bad. <laughs> you know? it's like, and we go through these emotional storms, you know, because our, our emotions are so tumultuous, you know. And, um, and so the thing is, where are we thinking? You know, is our thinking going to be able to help us to deal with the emotions in a reasonable way? Because feelings are spontaneous. They're like, you're right there, you know. Somebody says something, you know, you're a jerk. You know, feelings are going to be like, you know, defensiveness or, or you know, an assault on one's self-image or self-esteem. And so, so there's this thing that being alive is much more than just a feeling. Being alive means that we're alive in Jesus Christ. As he says, I came to give you life. Eternal life, but life also in the living the faith in this world now. And so it's not something that's completely delayed. You know, it's something that is in process now. You know, because salvation is a process. Once we accept Jesus Christ, there's more to it. There's a process of, being, of growing closer and closer to him. And again, that was encompassed in the stages of the spiritual life where the ultimate you know, stage is the unitive way. It's we, we're in full communion with God emotionally, intellectually, uh, the whole spiritual component of being in the context of the world, but knowing that this unity is keeping us going so we can persevere. And we all like to go to that stage, but there are the other stages, like the purgative, the illuminative, all those different stages in the spiritual life that are helping us to get to that point. You know, so we're blessed to be in the illuminative stage. You know. 
and, and, and super blessed in the unitive stage. But we got to get out of the purgatory, purgative stage. You know, because we need to purge ourselves of those things that interfere in our spiritual life and in our spiritual well-being. Okay? So now, okay, faith, hope, and love. You know, the three theological virtues, they all go together. And of course, the, the most perfect of all is love. Okay? But faith, you know, and hope, well, obviously, is part of love. You know, but love is, is the overall, you know, fulfillment of faith and hope. Okay, love. Okay, because, you know, uh, when we go, you know, to heaven, uh, when we, you know, go to be with, with the Lord, we find that we don't need faith anymore because it's been fulfilled. We don't need hope anymore because our hope has been fulfilled. And so what do we have left? We have love. The love of Jesus, the love of each other, the love of the kingdom of God, the love of heaven. Okay? And all the graces, you know, that, that go into that sanctifying grace, sacramental grace, actual grace, all the graces that we learned in, in school, okay? And so we, we, we go through a purification. Again, it's this purgative way, you know, and the purgation. When we receive the faith, you know, we, we know that we have to, you know, have a relationship with Jesus that's ongoing, okay? And so this whole sense of purification, we're being purified in our spiritual life and preparation. What are we preparing for? We're preparing for eternal life. We're preparing to go to heaven. Faith, hope, and love. And so it's about purification and preparation. Again, like I mentioned, the three stages of the spiritual life. Purgation, illumination, communion. And so we go through this purgative sense of being purified we come to knowledge and understanding. We're illuminated with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, religious education is an example. And so we find then the unitive stage, which means that's, that's the stage that the saints have gotten to. Okay. Uh, and that's why we venerate the saints. Because we know they're in heaven. So they know, we know that they're our best intercessors because they've lived a life of purity and illumination and they're in unity. And so unity is fulfilled completely because they're in heaven. So they understand, each particular saint understands a particular circumstance that they had to deal with in life. They can help us to deal with that same kind of situation. You know. And so we have patron saints. You know, like the patron saint of, um, of, of cancer is, is, is St. Peregrine. You know. um, the patron saint of animals is St. Francis. You know, because we love our, our doggies and our kitties, you know, and our pets. And, um, and of course, they're there for, for us, okay? And, and, of course, patron saints for, you know, for, for everything, you know. Uh, um, let's see. Well, you know. You know what they are, you know. Like the patron saint, uh, you know, for eyesight is, is St. Lucy, you know, and so on. Because Lucy, they, they took away her eyes because she became a Christian, you know. So that's a martyrdom. And so we pray to St. Lucy that we keep our eyes safe for God's sake. We want our, for God's sake, and for our sake, and for the sake of our family too. And sometimes that's not possible because sometimes we get eye ailments. Like say, for example, I've got glaucoma. So what do I got to do? I got to take drops every day. Okay. Where did the glaucoma come from? Who can I blame in my family for giving me glaucoma? <laughs> Nobody in my family has glaucoma unless my grandparents had it, but they didn't know what it was. Okay. Who do I blame for my diabetes? My dad! <laughs> you know? Well, I, you know, I mean that in a good way. I mean, you know, in the sense that we get these, our, our health history is very important so that we can address the problems that are genetic. Okay? But then we, we, we look at spiritual problems too. You know, a, a spiritual disturbance that's handed on to us because of improper teaching. You know, or because of, of a sense of not being a good example. A parent's not a good example, you know. Um, and, and we think in terms of, say, for example, <clears throat> in a marriage, you know, one spouse is unfaithful, okay? Consistently unfaithful. Well, how do the kids deal with that? You know, it's like, what's going to happen? Is mom going to leave? Or say, for example, you know, a child's in bed, and in the next room, the parents are arguing. And, and the child hears this. The parents don't know that the child hears this. But what is that doing to the child? 
you know. And so these are all things that are so extremely important. We need to take the time to think about these things and know what our feelings are. To be able to sort out our feelings. Are we angry? Why are we angry? Am I jealous? Why am I jealous? You know, we have to get to the root of what's disturbing us. Okay. All right, so now, okay, praying for the dead. This is where, where we get into something. Why do we pray for the dead? Okay. Why pray for them? Okay. Uh, those who are in hell are in hell. Those who are in heaven are in heaven. So why pray for people if they're in heaven? And we certainly are going to pray for people in hell because it's useless. And so particularly when we talk about the Catholic faith, we talk about this manifestation of preparation and, and, and purification, uh, which is, of course, you know, purgatory, um, which is a blessing. I mean, purgatory is a blessing. You know, we may have been taught some negative things about it, but the way that we see this is God, did, you know, is not rejected us. God has accepted us already. We're guaranteed to go to heaven. But there are some things we need to do so that we can be totally happy in heaven. There there's, needs to be something that will not hold us back. So the primary thing is belief in Jesus Christ, trying to the best of our ability to live out, you know, a faith uh, in purgation and illumination and by the grace of God, unitive. But, but the thing is, is that we are purified by the fiery love of God, of Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said, you know, I bring a fire to the earth. Well, he's not a pyromaniac. I mean, he's not going to set fire to everything in the sense of literality. He, the fire is passion. We associate passion with fire, the fire of love. I'm just on fire with love. I'm on fire with Jesus, you know. It's all a matter of the spirit. We have these, these images that present to us a deeper reality. That's what symbols are. I mean, look, at the, look at the symbols all around us. What are they saying? We got, we got pictures of Jesus. We got pictures of the infant of Prague. We got, you know, pictures of, um, I think that's an angel, isn't it? Yeah, picture of an angel, the sacred heart, Joseph, the stations of the cross. For God's sake, it's telling us something that's at such a deep level in terms of prayer. It reminds us. We need to be reminded. You know, there's something about, like when I pray in the morning, you know, let's give you a personal example, okay? I got, I got the, the, um, uh, the face of the, 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 the um, what is it called, the, the, the Shroud of Turin, okay? And, and, and it's a portrayal of Jesus when he, when, when he was suffering. This is after, you know, his, his death, when, when they wrapped him in the clothes, okay? And so, and so the thing is, is that, now I found that out an interesting thing. It says in the Gospels that, you know, uh, the, 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 wrap, the Shroud was there, but the Shroud that was around his head was in a separate place. Well, why would they make note of that? The reason is because in Hebrew culture at that time, when someone needed to get up from the table, but they, they're going to come back again, they fold their, 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 their napkin on the side, which says, I'm coming back. You know, and that way they don't interrupt conversation and stuff that's going on in terms of, of the banquet or, or the meal. So that was a symbol and the sign Jesus is coming back. There's the shroud separately in the head. He's, he's coming back. That's what that meant. Okay? And so, and so we see this sense, you know, that... Um, and, and so when I look at that, that, that's prayer to look at that. And then below it, I have a chalice with, with the host above it. You know, which is Catholic tradition for the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The body and blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? And so that helps me in, in my morning prayer. That's just an, an example. You have your own prayer techniques, or you have your own, you know, way of praying. You have your own holy cards. I got a bunch of holy cards, you know, from all my relatives. You know, they're there. It's like I remember my aunt Catherine. I remember her. My mom, my dad. You know, um, uh, John, John Harvey. You know, uh, my great um, cousin. All kinds of stuff like that. You know, these are all symbols. These are all things that we imagine when we look at something. It does something to us. When we look at art, we look at a picture. Oh, that's a beautiful picture, you know. <laughs> beautiful picture, you know, of, of a, a country scene. A picture of the mountains. A picture of the stars, you know. Then there's abstract art, like Picasso. And you look at that. What's that supposed to do to you? I guess I'm kind of prejudiced in a sense because, you know, abstract art, like a melting watch. You know, you look at a melting watch. What does that do to you? <laughs> looking at a melting watch, you know. Or, or looking at, you know, um, something that's like, 
you know, abstract. It, it's, it, it's, it, it, it's telling us something about chaos, but there's one. Salvador Dali has this one extremely beautiful picture of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it shows Jesus, his arms out on the cross, and you're looking down on him. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So there, there's Salvador Dali, who's kind of like an abstract guy in terms of art, but he did something beautiful. It's abstract in the sense that it's a perspective. You know, it's something that's out of the ordinary. There was nothing else like that before in terms of the images of Jesus Christ. Okay? So it's very important for us to realize we need those images, we need those symbols, we need that reinforcement in terms of looking at something. It does something to us. Okay? It does something inside. The nature of the soul, the mind, our feelings, and so on. Because we're, we're complex. We all got complexes. Some people use that as a, as a criticism. Oh man, they got a complex. A persecution plot complex. You know, they always feel like everybody's against them. You know, <laughs> complexes. But, you know, really in a sense, it doesn't have to be negative. We have all kinds of complexes, you know. Like say, for example, um, the savior complex. Somebody who wants to save everybody, you know. It's, it's symbolic in the sense that that person doesn't believe they're Jesus Christ, but they feel responsible, you know, for making everybody feel good, responsible for, you know, everybody's well-being. Well, that's impossible, you know. I mean, you can't do that and not be stressed out, okay? Your feelings get out, become overwhelming. And when we're overwhelmed by feelings, things can happen. You know, we become depressed, you know, we become, you know, hyper and, and so on. And, and so these things are not necessarily bad if they're used in the context of the spiritual life, okay? Many of the saints were depressed, you know. And, and, and so the thing was, they were able to be saintly even in the midst of depression. Or when they were real, you know, outgoing. I mean, we can picture, like St. Francis, for example. We take a look, at, think about him. He was probably a pretty upbeat guy, you know? He was probably fun to be with. He was probably spiritual to be with him. You know? And he had this love for animals. He had this love for creation. You know? And we have pictures of St. Francis. He's got a little lamb there, a deer. He's talking to a deer. You know? St. Francis Xavier talked to the cricket. It, it, that's the way it's portrayed. You know, it's like, you know, Brother Cricket. Because <laughs> it's Franciscan. That's the Franciscan dimension is, you know, the beauty of creation. So in a sense, St. Francis is the beauty of nature. That's what he represents. He's the patron saint of nature. A lot of people in their gardens have a statue of St. Francis. You know? I mean, it's magnificent. The richness of the culture of Christianity, and particularly Catholic Christianity, is a sense that all things become connected in the enrich enriching of our spiritual life. Okay? So now, we pray for the dead. They need us to remember them. Again, I mentioned last, next week, on Monday, we're going to have a celebration of remembrance. We're taking the time to remember. There's supposed to be like 60 people here coming to, to that you know, service. You know, of all different denominations, you know, Catholic, Protestant, you know, um, uh, Jewish people, they remember. Judaism. I'm not sure about Islam. I, I don't know that much about Islam to, uh, in terms of what they believe about the deceased or the dead. Um, well, there's a Garden of Allah. I know that. They talk about the Garden of Allah. So that's got their, you know, their idea or their concept of heaven. And, and for, for, for the Jews, um, well, obviously they believe in, 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 in heaven. I mean, they believe. Well, no, actually, we have to be careful with that because we know in the time of Jesus, the Pharisees believed in an afterlife. The Sadducees did not believe in the after, afterlife. Okay? It's important for us to know that historically. So not knowing enough about Judaism... I don't know how that divides up, you know, whatever. But anyway, but I had my little Jewish friends, you know. And um, I know one time, there my little Jew Jewish friend, Howard, um, of course, you know, we went to Catholic school, of course, and we, so we went and said, Howard, you need to believe in God. We need to believe in God. You need to believe in God. We're, we were doing our little evangelization, you know, in a kind of a, you know, distorted way. But it was like, Howard, you need to, you need to believe in God. And he says, I do. 
Something's not right, you know? Something's not, he believes in God. So are we doing something wrong here? Are we doing something right? Or what, what are we doing? So we go back, we ask our parents, and it's like, no, no, no. The Jewish people believe in God very strongly. It's just that they don't believe in Jesus. And so we go back out to Howard and say, Howard, you need to believe in Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus. You know, so we're trying to convert him. And the thing was, is that, you know, he, he, he was a Jewish person. And he was, I think he was kind of orthodox because... Um, the food had to be blessed by a rabbi, you know, and the Jewish people, like Kroger, right, they have a rabbi come in there to bless the food, you know, which is, which is a great thought. I think that's wonderful, you know. I mean, I'd be happy to go in there and bless, bless the food for Catholics, you know. <laughs> you know, these things are so beautifully human, you know. And, uh, but anyway, so we have a great respect for other denominations, other religions, you know, and, um, and so on, because there's an element of goodness and the potential for revelation that we believe as Christians ultimately, you know, leads to Jesus Christ. Okay. And so, all right, so that's, that's for that. Now, we need to remember them. Praying for the souls in purgatory, praying for our relatives, asking others to pray for us. Please pray for me. People tell me that all the time. You know, people say, you know, pray for me. Or when someone's deceased, pray for my relative. So I got this, I got these cards. I, I, I'll tell you, this is kind of a personal example, but anyway, uh, there's a sink in the, in the little, what do you call that, um, uh, kitchen? It's not really a kitchen, but anyway. Yeah, no, I had the sink in, in, in the bathroom, right? Well, I had Steve and the maintenance guy turn off the water, okay, in the sink in the little kitchen. And I made it my little shrine, you know. I made it my little prayer corner, you know. So I got... I got my, my, the prayer cards in order. I've got the, the liturgy of the hours over here on, on the right that go through those prayers. And so, and then I have um, a, little, so, a little gold plate and I've got a big um, pyx. It's about that big as for, you know, when I was traveling and saying mass in, in other places, I, I carried, you know, that with me. Um, and so in there I have all the scapulars. All will say scaffolds. And, and all of them are like third class relics. You know, it's just a piece of the, you know, the um, uh, piece of the, uh, what is it, the, clo the, the clothes of um, Padre Pio. You know, uh, I don't have, I have maybe two or three, you know, first class relics. Okay. And, and also I have, you know, something, with, uh, this was touched to the cloth or the robe of uh, Saint, um, um, Maximilian Colby, or whatever, you know? So I have this there. And then under that, I have my list of people that I'm praying for. I list them. Like just recently, you know, um, uh, Deacon Jack's brother Billy died, so I, I put his name on there because I'm praying. He's, he's on my prayer list, you know? And, and so these are the things that I do. This is my prayer routine, okay? The only reason I can do these things is my parents taught me well. The sisters taught me well. And so I accept that very deep. I'm so thankful for that. No, I'm not perfect. I yell at a bingo. I shouldn't be doing that. I know that. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I just, I want to repent for that, you know. I mean, don't have to be that loud. But my mother was that way. For gosh sakes, my mother was that way. You know, we go to the casino, right? We go to the casino, okay? She loved to go to the casinos, right? Well, she's got the slot machines, right? She said, hit me, baby. Come to me, mom. Come to mama. Jesus, help me. You know, I said, mom, don't talk to the machines. Look at these people are looking at us like we're crazy. You know, but she was so expressive. Well, you know, guess who I take after, you know? And my brother takes after my dad. Well, well, you know, uh, I don't know about that. You know, I'll think about it. I'll think about it, you know. And it's just like, good God, what do our parents give us? They give us good things, mostly we hope, but they give us some like kind of, Maybe necessarily some, you know, negative things, okay? So here I am, going to confession. I'm sorry I shout so loud and bingo, okay? I'll try not to. I really will. I'll try not to scare people, you know? Especially Joan. Joan gets very scared. She's right next to me. And Father Robert. And Father Robert's like, <laughs> you know, he's asleep. But then he gets wake, wake down. God bless him. He's, he's my best friend. Okay, now, all right. Well, that's, that's neither here nor there, but it's interesting nonetheless. Okay, all right, here we go. All right. You're asking for those to pray for us. Asking for the saints to pray for us. Asking Jesus, Mary, um, our relatives to pray for us. Those on earth and in heaven. Okay. 
And so, okay, in heaven. All right. Also, those in purgatory can pray for us. When they're being purified, you know, it's a sense that they're still part of the communion of saints. You know, because anybody that's in heaven is a saint. You know, your mother, your dad, they're in, they're in heaven. They, they, you can ask them to pray for you. One time my spiritual director said to me, you know, pray to Mary, you know, to help you in terms of, you know, your, your, your effect, the, way, the effect that you have on people, her gentleness, her caring. And then, you know, pray to your mom. I never thought of it that way, you know. But, and so we pray, hey, mom, help me, you know. You've been so good to me in this life. Please be good to me in the next. You know, it's, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Okay. So anyway, that's interesting. All right. Asking others to pray for us. Okay. All those in purgatory can pray for us. And it's all about, you know, what we talk about in terms of we say being in communion. In communion with the saints. The communion of saints. We're in communion. We're in unity. Okay. Being in union. You know. We're in union, the unitive way, the unitive way, the ideal of spiritual development, to be in the unitive way, to be in union, being in relationship even beyond this life. We're still having a relationship with our f families and friends that have gone on before us. We're still in relationship with them, you know. We're still aware of them. We remember them. And so there's an, there's an interconnectedness in a process leading to completion. It's all about completion. Okay. I've completed my task. We feel good about that. I've completed this. I'm almost going to complete my project. I'm going to complete my paper. You know, and I used to always be happy about that when I was writing a paper in seminary. I'm going to complete my paper the next day. If I don't be procrastinating, I'll get it done the next day. Completion, we're all about complete. We want to be complete. We want to be integrated in terms of our every aspect of our being so that every aspect of our being is helping us and there's not something that's working against us. You know? And there are things that tend to work against us. Our moods can work against us. Our illnesses, our sicknesses can work against us. You know? and, and we have to find a way where that, that's all encompassed in the spiritual life. When we look back in our life, we see so many things that we've gone through. Heck, I'm old enough now where I'm looking back now, you know. And I didn't do a lot of that before. I mean, I was too busy. You know, I was always doing something. You know, I guess I was kind of a workaholic. But, you know, I was always involved in something. And so now, when we get to be the, our age, let's put it that way, being united here, you know, we get to be our age, we look back and we say, how the heck did I ever survive that? God had to be looking over me. He's slow to anger which is another whole theological understanding. But anyway, I can't go into that now. But the thing is, he loves us. He's so extremely patient. And he finds a way to get us back if we stray. Through the angels. We, the angels are helping us all the time. You know, we have guarding angels. What's the, what's the angel doing? He's guarding us. How he's doing that is mystical. It's spiritual. And that's, that's the richness of faith. Okay? All right. To know, and of course... As the Baltimore Catechism, I'm going to end pretty soon. Um, okay, now, as the Baltimore <coughs> Catechism says, okay, to know, love, and serve God in this life and to be happy with Him forever in the next. What a beautiful thing to know. That sums it all up in just those few words. You know, when we think about the Gospels, you know, the words are sufficient. You know, with the reading that I just read a little while ago at the beginning, there's so much that's said in those two verses in that chapter. The power. In the beginning, there was the Word. The Word is powerful. What we say to others is powerful. Yeah. The way we express ourselves is, 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 is powerful. How do we come across to somebody? How, how do we get a sense of what they're feeling? Well, we're complex in the sense that we can communicate verbally, uh, but there's also you know, the communication of, you know, see, somebody looks like they're not feeling so good. We can sense that. You know, it's a feeling. And so something's transferred from that person to us on a feeling level. It's magnificent when we think about the complexity of that. When we see somebody hurting, it's transferred to us because in some way 
we feel their pain. And we imagine how, how difficult that must be. And, and, and we even do it with our animals. Like my, when my little kitty, you know, Gizmo, you know, was, was not well, and, and she was, you know, her, her kidneys were failing, and it was like, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, I, for some reason, it's like I could feel that in some way, you know? And so then when I had to put her down because she was suffering, you know, it was like, I cried for two days. It's a cat. You know, how do you become attached to a cat? Well, you, you love them, you know, and they love you. Gizmo was the most intelligent cat in the whole world. She knew how to take care of me, you know. She didn't like one of the seminarians, but that's a whole, another whole story. Okay, all right, so is this like Lucky? No, Lucky, remember Lucky, uh, Monsignor's, uh, uh, Buccanini's dog, you know, it's like he only loved Monsignor. He couldn't stand everybody else, you know. Monsignor, he'd always be with Monsignor, Monsignor, he'd love him, you know, and stuff like that. I walk into the rectory, and, and, and she's like, would not turn her back to me. You know, I was like, I'm not going to hurt you, you little, you little doggy. You see, go into my, uh, under Monsignor's bed, and I'd go in there, and I'd eventually, gradually be able to pet her, you know. And she got a little warmer to me. Not much, but a little bit. And there's one priest that couldn't stand the dog. And the dog didn't like him, but that's another whole story. I want to talk about that now. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay. And so... And so we, this, the, to know, love, and serve God in this life and be happy with him forever in the next, it's all about destiny. Okay? It's all about arrival. I finally have arrived. You know? It's all about finality. Jesus on the cross says, it's finished. Thank God it's finished. Oh, oh Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It's finished. Okay? Eternally. Eternity. Eternally. Forever. If we could even conceive of forever, never ending. Okay? The uniting of the soul with the glorified body. That is our destiny. That is our arrival. That is our finality. That is our eternity. Amen. I'm going to end with a prayer. Okay? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect upon the great mysteries of faith. We ask that you continue to help us and guide us in all of our deliberations. We pray that we will be able to discern your will and have the courage and the strength and the perseverance to do your will. We ask this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. May Almighty God bless you all, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, that's it. Oh, well. But anyway, um, next week, same time, same place. Next week. Friday, 1 o'clock. There you go.